Okay, so let's get started. Okay. So I'm Phil Cardozo, University of Illinois, and I'm here with Kate and Katie to talk about their recently accepted or article in press called The Effects of Prepartum Stocking Density in a Blind on Physiological Biomarkers, Health, and Hygiene of Transition Host Dairy Cows. So maybe we could start with intro, Kate, and then Katie. Sure. Um, my name is Kate Krutzinger. I am currently a postdoc at the University of Guelph. Um, but before that, and for this paper that we're talking about today, I was doing my PhD at Ohio State with Katie Proudfoot. And I'm Katie Proudfoot. I'm currently an associate professor at the University of Prince Edward Island in the Atlantic Veterinary College, but was formerly a faculty member at Ohio State and served as Kate's PhD supervisor. Cool. So uh, I think we could start by uh, Katie or Kate, doesn't matter. Uh, how did you guys get to this idea? So what uh, to put a blind or I think stocking density is something that it's more in, in our heads, at least, I guess, right? That, hey, you have a lot of cows that are not supposed to, bad things are going to happen. But now the blind, that's kind of uh, a little bit intriguing. And we can get into the specifics of the blind and where to put it and how big and all that stuff as well. So, but, but how did you get to this design of this experiment? Sure, Katie, do you want me to take the lead on this one or would you rather take the lead? Go for it. Okay, great. So um, I can come back around to stocking density in a minute, but the reason that we really wanted to look at the blind was because based on some of Katie's research in the early 2010s and then some other research done out of Aarhus, which looked at sort of maternity pen design and how cows want to calve indoors. And um, we found that similar to natural environments, um, so outdoor settings, cows like to calve in privacy. And um, so if they have opportunities within their indoor settings to seek isolation from other cows, whether it be in individual maternity pens or in group maternity pens, they will use resources to do so. And to take one step back from that, the idea of giving cows blinds in indoor calving pens was based on the research that's been done in natural or semi-natural environments where cows seek isolation from their herd members. So they will move away from other animals and then look for um, protection in their environment, like tall grasses or trees, um, soft, dry ground to give birth. And so what we wanted to do was in an indoor group pen where there are multiple other cows, give them the opportunity to perform some of those natural behaviors where they could seek isolation, even though there were humans as well as other cows around um, and limited space to, to get that sort of inter-cow distance. So th that was one thing that I was curious about. So mm -hmm. you've mentioned that they want to hide from the other cows, but also from humans, or do we know that or not? Like, if I just hide them from humans, but then they are there with other cows where they cannot hide. Is that something that would help or no? They need to be, they like to hide from people and cows and everything around. In nature, cows like to hide from other cows when people aren't around. But in one of Katie's papers, I think from, was it 2014 maybe? Which one? The, uh, the pear the study? One? Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Um, cows calved in hides more during the day than they did at night. And I think that your sort of theory behind that was because they were trying to avoid people when they were around during the day, but if people weren't around at night, then they weren't as likely to use it. Yeah. And I'll add to that, that I'm not sure we know the answer to that question about people. And I, th and we also don't know exactly in a natural setting, what's causing them to hide because there could also be, it could also be an anti-predator strategy. Um, but it's probably a combination of anti-predator and distancing from other cows that especially other cows that are about to give birth themselves and have the maternal hormones going through their bodies. And if they see a calf on the ground, what's the first thing they're going to do is they're going to go and potentially try to take that calf. So 
the theory is that they separate to prevent other cows from taking their calf, giving them the cow and the calf time to mm -hmm. bond. And so we thought that the nighttime, the reason they didn't calve <clears throat> um, in a hide at nighttime is because it was already quiet and dark. And in nature, there's been some, uh, one study at least that looked at that in, um, I forget if it was deer or elk, but at night they also didn't leave or they didn't move away from human activity and things like that. So maybe at nighttime there just isn't the need to hide because it's already, there's not predators around, other cows are occupied, resting. It just isn't that need to hide. Okay, and then, uh... How, how did you guys come up with the blind? And uh, in the paper, you guys do a good job about putting like a blueprint of how you design the pens with the varying the stocking density, but also where you put it, the blind. And you actually provide a picture of the blind and it seems to be very feasible to build, right? It's like a board and there's something called... Uh, two Jersey style road barriers yes. filled with water and a plywood addition. That's it. How did you guys come up with that height and that configuration? Yeah, the, the blind design was definitely trial and error. Um, the previous research giving cows hides or blinds indoors have pretty much been all three complete walls and then one partial wall where a cow can come and go as she pleases. And so for this study, we did sort of a trial run before the study started to see what type of blinds cows would use. So we used single-sided barriers or blinds like the one that's in the study. We used a big X to see if cows would use the multiple sides and they decided that was a really good scratching post and sort of just pushed it around like a merry-go-round and then we also wanted to use something that our farm crew could easily maneuver around. It was a deep bedded pack. And so they provided cows with new bedding every other day and then completely cleaned the bedded pack uh, once every two to three weeks. And so we wanted to insert something that wasn't really high maintenance because we wanted it to be something that could be easily applied to other, you know, commercial dairy farms if the cows liked it. And so this was actually a brainchild of Heather Dan. We were looking for what we could build our blind with. And she was driving down the highway one day and she called me and she said, what if we used actual road barriers to build it? And so what those are, and you can see them in the picture, is they are plastic barriers that are used for construction or road traffic. They are about 100 pounds when they're empty. So they're really easy to move by one person or two people. But then when you fill them with water, they weigh over 1300 pounds. So we had two blinds that were put together and we could easily move them. I could move them with the help of one other person. And then once they were installed, the cows couldn't move them at all. And that was our criteria was um, the cows couldn't shift the position in the pen. So it worked great from that aspect. And then the way that we had it positioned in the pen so served two purposes. One, it was functionality. So our farm crew could easily drive on either side of the blind to add bedding or to clean the pack out fully without ever having to move them. And then the other function was we wanted to allow cows to perform natural behaviors without reducing blind use for, from competition. Um, so an important behavior the dairy cattle perform because they are prey species is vigilance behavior. And this is true at calving too. They wanna to be able to have a lookout to see what else is going on. And so with our blind, cows could stand up and look over the blind and see what was going on. But then they could also lie down and feel completely covered on one side. And then as far as competition goes, there, was, there have been a few studies that came out about blind use. Um, and what we have found is that cows use the blind less when there are, there's an increased cow to blind ratio. And so all of the cows in our pens were within about three weeks of calving. And so we wanted to make sure that it wasn't an area in the pen where um, more subordinate cows could potentially be bullied by dominant cows to stop using the blind 
or get trapped in an air, get trapped in a blind, you know, like a three wall blind where they couldn't escape. So what this did was it allowed cows to move freely around the blind without creating any closed corners. So. So it's, it's pretty much, you have the pan mm -hmm. and then you just put that little line there per se, or a little blind that they can go around and where to put in the pan related to water or something that is not a specific, you could put in any place you think, uh, or. I'll add, I think what was really cool about how Kate showed her data in the paper. Oh, wait, sorry. This is the next paper coming yeah. out. <laughs> so in the next paper coming out, one really cool way that Kate shows her data is that she shows a heat map and she shows where cows calve using the, like the how dark a color is. And I think something really interesting that will be coming out hopefully soon um, is that cows avoid certain areas of the pin as well. And being and around the water, the water bin, they actually avoid calving near that probably because it's it's more wet or more high, a high traffic area. They also avoid near entrances to the feed bunk and exits to the alley. So I would say there's places in the pin I wouldn't put it. I wouldn't put it near the water. I wouldn't put it near high traffic areas. So I liked the way that where Kate chose to put it, which was kind of it wasn't in the corner, but it was, it allowed cows to walk around it, but it wasn't in a, a really high traffic area of the pen. I see. So the figure that we have in the paper is kind of pretty, the blueprint is that really where that blind was it? So like in the small pen, the mm -hmm. overcrowded, that was fairly in the middle and the other one was a little bit uh, right. to the left, let's say, but they were at the same uh relationship with this small small metal gate. Yeah, so within, so we created our one main blind that was made out of the road jersey barriers. Um, but then in that pen, in the pens that contain the blind, we also provided shade cloth at the back of the pen. And um, so it was dark, the cows couldn't see through the gates. And then there was a short wall that we provided for additional lying spaces. Oh, that's the yeah. shade cloth. So why you need the small metal gate? What is that? We originally thought that cows might use it if there was competition over the blind. We found that to be not at all true. Okay, so what, tell me more about this gate. I have no idea what you're talking about here. Like they would open and close the gate? Uh, no, nope. it was just another way of adding more slightly protected lying areas. So it was just really a small, um, just a small metal gate, which I think is how it's described in the paper. It was four feet long. And then we installed it to the back fence of the pen. And so we could swing it open or swing it closed if pens needed to be cleaned. Um, but then it stayed open at a 45 degree angle to the back of the, the back wall of the pen. Okay, so in that corner, you didn't have cows going there. That's what yeah. you're saying. Mm -hmm. They didn't like that gate idea. They laid next to it when they weren't calving, but they didn't use it to give birth, no. Okay. Yeah. So, but you guys did the, the research from, you know, prepartum, I think was minus 20. Let's see. Minus 24. Yeah. That was your baseline, mm -hmm. right? And then you went until 14 days after calving at least with Demetritus. Right, so cows were enrolled in the prepartum pens that we used as our experimental pens about based on 21 days before calving, their expected calving date. And then they remained in those pens until they gave birth. And once they gave birth, we moved them into a freestall pen. Okay, and then, um, so this prepartum pen was mm -hmm. where they would calve as well. Right. Right, okay. So in farms that they have a maternity pen where they move that cow there two, three days, um, you know, do you think that the blind would apply as well or that concept? What do you think? So cows were here for, I'd say 21 days, right, maximum. But when you move cows to maternity pen, they may stay there, I don't know, two days. Sometimes they want it one day. 
Kev and go, don't stay here forever. That would still be true, you think, that the blind, they, they would prefer to, to use that or? Yeah, in my opinion, it would still apply because what we were looking to do was facilitate calving specific behaviors with the blind. And then one of the things that we found with a paper that'll be coming out hopefully soon is that cows perform specific behaviors to calving in indoor pens that start somewhere between four to 24 hours before calving that we don't see up until sort of that crucial calving period where a cow is looking for a place to give birth. So even for cows who are moved into individual maternity pens or maternity pens a few days before calving, those behaviors will still begin as she um, prepares to give birth. Yeah, and I'll add that in some of our previous work, some of the stuff that, uh, that I did with my PhD, we didn't move cows in until a day or two days before, but those were into either pair or individual pens, which I think can be designed a little bit different than what Kate has done. I think in a group pen, what she did was is a pretty practical, cheap and easy way of doing it. If you're doing an individual pen, there's other strategies that you can use to pr provide a hiding space. Okay, so out of the blind, so now I at least have a good assessment but, uh, on the blind, and then the stocking density, you give a number here, but I just wanted to grab like a, how many cows per pen you're talking about here, do you remember? Yeah, the range was from six to 10 cows per pen. And those were in a, both our high and low stocking density pens. So what we did to alter the stocking density was altered the pen size, but then the group size of cows stayed consistent. Okay, and th tell me more about the how they were fed. Uh, so when you're talking about the density, I think you're related to the lying space, not necessarily to the number of headlocks or you call feed bins or something. Yeah, we fed cows using individual feeding pin then individual feeding bins that they were trained to use. And then they wore, they were Kalen feeding bins. And then the cows wore a collar with a magnet in it that unlocked their corresponding feeding bin. And we did that to be able to look at individual feed intakes. So each cow had one headlock. Um, so feeding space stayed consistent across the treatments. I see. Yeah. Also, that's one of the things that maybe, uh, your high density mm -hmm. could be even worse in a real situation, right? Where they have to compete for that bunk space. Your cows didn't have to compete, right? Right. Yep. In, in typical dairies, those two things would be related, but we chose to control for feeding, feeding space so that we could look at those dry matter intakes. Okay. So in this paper here, you don't talk about the intakes, right? No, we don't. Okay, that's yeah. the next one coming, <laughs> or the next two, or the next three. So, if you have uh, questions, ask Heather. <laughs> <laughs> Not in the next two, but potentially that would be paper number four. Yeah. Oh boy, no, that's very good. Uh, okay, so then, so you have your uh, overcrowding your space related to, to lying, and you have here the area that goes from the low around 15 to 25 square meters of mm -hmm. better pack. And then the high stocking density was from 7.7 7 to 12.9 square meters. Uh, so pretty much double, let's say, right? Roughly you cut it in half what you have. And you'd say that your low density, that's what usually was being done at that farm or that's what, what they do? We chose our stocking densities based on figures that we took from the literature. There aren't a lot of, I would say, there's not a lot of references to how much space cows should have in group maternity pens, how much square foot per how many square feet per cow there should be. So we took the low end of what we saw in the literature and then doubled it. Got it. Yeah, so our practices, uh, yeah, our study treatments weren't based on, on farm practices, but really what we saw was being recommended to producers. 
Okay, and then you have a crossover design. So, and you have uh, a very intricate or kind of a pretty cool stuff on how did you manipulate those pans so that you wouldn't be, oh yeah, you have that pan, but now you have a location and that's what's causing the difference. And you kind of eliminated that. Can you tell a little bit more about how you did it? Sure, so our study was a two by two factorial arrangement of treatments, including the low and high stocking density and then pens with a blind and then pens that were what I'll call barren. They didn't have any additional features. We didn't make any changes to the pen. And then what we did was there was one really long bedded pack. And I wish I had a photo of the minor barn to show this because it's kind of difficult to explain, but it was one long bedded pack and then gates within that really large area. And what we did was we used gates within the bedded pack to create our treatment pens. And so if you were to look at the pen from the entire large bedded pack from left to right, we started out with, let's say, high stocking density, no blind, and then did low stocking density, no blind. And then after that was high stocking density with a blind. And then after that was low stocking density with a blind. And then about every three months, what we did was we changed the location of our treatment pens. And so we did that pretty much by moving the blind that we had installed because it was easily movable and then changing the position of the gates. So from for the next re repetition, we could make the pen from left to right go low stocking density, no blind, high stocking density, no blind, low stocking density with a blind, high stocking density with a blind, et cetera. And so what we did was we changed the location of our experimental pens within the larger bedded pack four times so that each of our treatment pens was in all areas of the bedded pack. Okay. Mm -hmm. And did you, did you see any in interaction there or no? You just... Uh, no, we didn't no? test for an interaction, which I suppose we could have, but within our statistical analysis, we used um, location as a random effect. Cool. Mm -hmm. So then what were the main things that you'd like to, to highlight here. So you collect blood samples. You mm -hmm. also went out there and you collected uh, or measure vaginal discharge using the match check. Uh, this one doesn't have the intake. You did body condition score and you have access of some diseases uh, like subclinical ketosis, right? Mm -hmm. And you had some inflammation markers like haptoglobin you had NIFA here, and you also have some assessment on dystocia, is that right? Uh, no dystocia for this paper. We included assisted calving as one of our okay. uh, factors in some of the statistical analysis, but it wasn't one of the, one of our main effects that we looked at. Okay, so what would you say are your, your main findings here? Sure. So, and you know, unfortunately, we didn't find any of our treatment effects on NEFA or BHPA, which are predictors typically used for transition cow success. Um, and I think that as we talked about, you know, just a few minutes ago, that some of that could potentially be attributed to consistent feeding space because we didn't analyze feeding behavior. But I think if we had, if it it might have been consistent because that space or ability to access feed shouldn't have changed between our, our treatments. Um, but then we found a couple of interesting things. The first thing that I think is rather interesting is that there was a difference in hygiene between our high and low stocking density pens. Cows in high stocking density pens had poorer hygiene than those in low stocking density pens. Um, and I think that this is interesting for a couple of reasons. The first being that from the cow's perspective, cows don't like to lie in wet areas during, during lactation. And I would say probably during calving either because we see that they seek dry, soft places to give birth. Um, so this could be telling us that cows might not wanna give birth in those areas just because they're dirtier, um, but it could also increase their risk of disease after calving. And, we didn't measure calves, but 
If someone else wanted to, they might look at calf health as it's affected by hygiene in the maternity pen. Um, and then the other thing that we found that is maybe interesting, but I think requires more investigation is the outcome of haptoglobin. We found that cows in pens with a blind before calving had statistically greater haptoglobin concentrations than cows without a blind. Um, the differences weren't large and they may not be biologically relevant. And so that's where I say they should require some additional investigation. But something interesting that has come out of the human literature is that people with increased chronic stress have greater haptoglobin concentrations resulting in more inflammation. And so there may be some impact of the social environment not having in, in particular a blind to hide at calving that could be affecting um, haptoglobin in our prepartum cows. Kate, hey, just to clarify, you said that the cows in the low, in, sorry, without a blind, with a blind had more haptoglobin? Cows without a blind had okay. haptoglobin. Okay, to clarify, because I'm pretty okay. sure I think you said the opposite. Did I say it backwards? <laughs> yep. Okay. <laughs> okay, so the cows without a blind have higher haptoglobin. Before calving, yep. Before cal calving. Mm -hmm. And you also measure after calving? We did, but we didn't find any differences after calving. And after calving, they were out of this pen and into a freestyle pen. So that could have been the reason for that. But as I'll mention too, that Kate already mentioned, I think obviously take that result with caution just because <laughs> it didn't really reach any sort of biologically relevant levels in terms of predictors for disease or things like that. So I think it is something, as Kate said, that would be really neat for someone to follow up with. Yeah, there is uh, something I'm trying to look. Yeah, I was looking here because you're reporting the log of the haptoglobin, right? That yeah, was, that's I was why it's a little confusing. I just looked at it too. Yeah, so I got it. Okay, there is the difference there, 1.44 mm -hmm. versus 1.52. But uh, yeah, so you have the log, okay. And then it's There's... back transformed in parentheses. Oh, look at that. Mm -hmm. So it is point. 24 for no blind and 0.22 for yes blind. Right. Okay. So that could be a response of lower chronic stress. That's kind of one of the, the points to discuss. But you say something in your abstract. You say, so, you know, uh, although the reason for this paradox, and then I'm going to get into the uh, metritis deal, the reason for this paradox isn't clear the effects of prepartum stocking density uh, may require further uh, exploration. And here, I think you're referring to uh, that you had higher odds for metritis in the low prepartum stocking density. Is that right? So we had a tendency. It wasn't super statistically significant, but there was a tendency for cows to have greater metritis after calving if they were housed in low stocking density pens before calving. I see. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's one thing I think when you, you know, you characterize your, you know, the density being not related to feeding, right? And I think that explains some of the things on the NEFA and the BHP. Uh, but then going back to, you know, metritis, I think also there is some kind of, a, how can I say, discussion that can come there, right? So, uh, and there are whole, that's why I was, uh, uh, that I mentioned um, Stephen LeBlanc about, you know, talking about this, because the, what we are doing is just you have this vaginal discharge that you are evaluating, and, you, and we think that this is coming from the uterus, right? Mm -hmm. uh, to be honest, I don't think we really know that. Uh, and I think there's a lot of uh, people that are trying to understand that, but you're giving your score based on that composition of that uh, discharge versus smell and uh, not versus, but adding smell. And also you do have the, uh, the rectal temperature here to associate. And then you'd say zero, one, two, three, four. Uh, and of course, I think the fever is something different. 
Uh, so that's what I wonder if you dig in and more like say, uh, take the smell versus the visual score and how does that play? Because I could argue that more discharge would be better. Uh, not necessarily bad if not associated with smell or fever. Right. Makes sense. But when you put all together, then you're, you're maybe yeah, confounding that a, a little bit, I think, even though it's the way that we have the associations with lower pregnancy later on, right? And uh, so I don't know. I think we, we don't know very well yet, but I think that would be something that I'm not totally convinced that a high vaginal discharge is something really bad. Uh, th does it make sense or no? Yeah, Katie, you looked like you were about to say something. Only to agree with you, Phil. Yeah, and so just to clarify, in the and this is nicely shown in the table table three, and we put all the data there so that readers can make their interpretation how they how they want to, and then we discuss it similarly to how you've have you've explained it, Phil, is that we're not sure what this means. And so we weren't very confident saying low stocking density equals bad for metritis because we don't think that's what is happening. But for mild, what Kate calls mild here, these do have a smell. So mm -hmm. smell is included in mild. If you look at severe, they, they could have had a fever. And this is where you have the putrid discharge, the less subjective of the scoring. Um, and if you look at severe, there isn't a difference. If anything, arithmetically, high stocking density is higher. So it's really just with the mild cows. They're the cows that had, as you said, they had the discharge, but that did have um, the smell associated with it. So it's it's not extremely clear what the story is telling us. Um, and it also just doesn't make sense either. And we tried to discuss that in our discussion, what could be going on if this was actually the case. But again, I think it's something for maybe a larger sample size um, and a, and a follow-up study to investigate. Yeah. Hey, and it, to add? No, just that I, you know, was going to agree with you guys, especially about Phil, what you were saying with more discharge, not necessarily being a bad thing. I think we used the scoring system that's been historically used for studies like this. Um, but maybe that's something to take into consideration in the future because looking at the breakdown of the percentage of animals with what we called mild metritis, which would have been discharge, but not a fever and not putrid, um, was higher for low. But then as Katie said, for the severe cows who really might've had you know, metritis and been sick, there wasn't a difference that we observed. Yeah, I, I think that's the, you know, I'm not, uh, it depends on how invasive you want to go. I'm not sure that only more cows would add to this story, but I think, let's say, a uterine biopsy or, uh, you know, the cytobrush or things that maybe are not, uh, could bother other things or they are a little bit more invasive, right, that do not allow you to evaluate other things. But I think we're still trying to understand what would really mean that this cow has a uterine infection and that's going to be problematic. I think we have previous association of scores and going bad and things happening, but uh, yeah, I think that would be interesting and uh, to know and that. So yeah, I, I agree with you guys. I'll but, add something too, and Kate, feel free to chime in here because we've had many discussions about this, but I think the other thing to consider is that these cows were moved from a relatively, especially the low stocking density, a relatively calm environment to postpartum. They were, they were a little bit overstocked. So it was like 120%, I think. Um, they were in a free stall and it wasn't, you know, it was potentially what happened in the first few days after calving could have had more of an effect on their risk of metritis than, um, what we gave them in our treatment pen. So I think that's something else for us to consider is that from the cow's perspective, also the juxtaposition of the prepartum pen to the postpartum pen. If you're gonna keep them low stress prepartum, 
why would you then increase stress right immediately after calving? That doesn't make sense. So I think that would be an, an interesting follow-up. And Kate and I have talked about this. Kate, I don't know if there's anything else you want to add there. Not really, just that we've sort of chatted about, you know, from the cow's perspective, how does it feel to go from a low, relatively nice, low stocking density, relatively nice pen to the shocker of the fresh pen, which is a completely different environment. How much do they, you know, physically and emotionally go, oh shoot. And then how does that affect their immune function or, you know, the effects that we see for transition cow success? Not that I'm saying if you're going to overcrowd your cows in the fresh pen that you should <laughs> overcrowd the free part and by any means. <laughs> I see. So do you think there would be a need for a low stress environment the first week or first five days or? At least. Yeah, especially after we've done this research and getting really well acquainted with pre partum pen management and then looking at how cows are managed after calving. I think that we treat fresh cows like high producing lactating cows when physically they're really much different. And so I think that something that we don't have right now that should really be investigated in the near future is how cows are treated during the first week or two after calving because really they should be in recovering mode. There's, you know, calving on its own is a substantial physical stressor and so is the onset of lactation. And that's not even taking into the account the social stressors of cow-calf separation, introduction to a new environment and regrouping with new animals. And so I sort of think that we're doing cows a disservice when we move them directly from prepartum pens into standard lactating pens. Yeah, that's, that's a very good point that we think there's a lot of uh, nutritional aspects related to it, but also the behavior one, it's, um, it's pretty important. I don't think we, we pay too much attention to that, right? I think yeah. you're right. Hmm. And uh, anything else that you guys want to talk about this paper before I ask about the next ones? Not really, in my opinion, you know, we found some really interesting behavioral outcomes and especially when paired with this paper serves a really nice comprehensive look at what's going on in group prepartum pens. Okay, so based on this paper, I mean, you, you guys have other information, but would you recommend that every farm should have a blind? I'm not sure in the, in the setup that you have, but maybe, something similar to it what would you say i'll feel, i'll take this one and then katie you can play you can play clean up um i would recommend providing cows a blind absolutely so even you know if cows don't necessarily choose to use it providing them a choice is what's really crucial we see a lot of individual variability between cows who do want to use the blind or don't want to use the blind what drives that is sort of unclear but i think what's really important is giving cows um, agency of being able to choose where they want to calve and giving them a blind does that i absolutely concur that's good. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. What drives, is it previous experience or do you saw a difference? Did you see difference between the heifers and the mefipers cows where heifers would go more to the blind versus the mefipers cows said, hey, I already calved, so I don't care. I go anywhere. And the prefipers, they were look still targeted because one, one thing that uh, I wonder is that, you know, and especially when you see other cows, for example, if I see uh, jeer cows in Brazil, well, they need to have the calf and the milking power so they can have milk let down, right? So they are not as detached from their behavior, maybe, or their original behavior than a hosting cow that we assume they are very detached to this natural behavior. They don't need the calf. They barely need anything. They are ready to go to our... Uh, 
huge farms, right? Or to our farms. Uh, but may, maybe that's not true. Maybe they just were adapted physiologically, genetically, but not on the behavior or they were adapted to the point where we don't perceive that, but that is still happening. If, so we don't see the not milk let down, but they are having something else that we just don't measure, right? So do you give some thought, do you guys talk about this or, or no? There was a paper that came out within the last year um, from University of Tennessee that looked at calving behaviors on pasture for Holstein dairy cattle. And the, I think it was about five acres and the topographical distribution was pretty interesting. There was a barn with overhead cover that was, I think, deep straw bedded where there were cows were yep. fed. There was an open pasture that was mowed and the grass was short. And then after that was um, an area with what I would call natural cover with tall grass and trees. And the really interesting finding from this study was that cows or heifers who were giving birth for the first time really liked the natural area with the trees and grasses and the cows who were giving birth for the second or greater time liked to calve in the man-made barn and no one liked to calve in the middle where the grass was short. And so the authors sort of speculated on what the difference was, whether this was dominance. So the mature cows wanted to be close to the feed and so the heifers left or whether it was previous experience. Um, I think from my perspective, I would say that we're not at this point really sure what drives those differences. If we look at papers where cows are housed um, on pasture and semi-natural environments, stuff that came out in the 80s and 90s, we see that the environment is really important. Um, so cows really want to have some sort of shelter or cover. But other than that, I think that, you know, like you were saying about there are things that cows maybe need that we don't perceive or haven't measured yet is really um, intuitive because I think that there are a lot of things about calving behavior that we still don't understand. Yeah. And the only thing I'll add to that is that I think going off of that, cows still retain a lot of their natural instincts and without giving them the opportunity to see those instincts, that's when we see them, as you said, Phil, like they, mm -hmm. they don't need their calf. They don't act as, you know, aggressive as a beef calf when, or cow when she loses her calf and things like that. But I don't think that's really the case. I think we've bred for docility. Um, so they're not going to be as aggressive, but does that mean that they're less attached to their calf or does that mean that they're less likely to go if you give them the opportunity to go off in the back 40 we found that they will that Holstein commercial Holstein dairy cows will go off in the back 40 if you give them the opportunity to just like a beef cow would and just like a moose would um, or wild ungulate so I think there are a lot of those natural behaviors that we just don't see because we don't give them the opportunity to perform them in, in the case let's say the half of uh, like the the paper you're uh, mentioning from uh, Tennessee, and actually I'll try to find and put a link, uh, a description in the link, but uh, the other thing is, and it reminds me, you know, being an advisor of grad students, is the want and the need, right? So let's say the cow has that preference, but that's not good for her. So I, that know everything, I should tell them what to do. When, when do you know that you are in something, ooh, this is something that I need to provide for the cow, or it's just like something that it doesn't matter. She can go there or not there, or it's just like a want that really is not a need for the cow, right? Uh, does that get exercise or how do you approach that? Kate, I think you got this question in your defense, so I'll let you answer right. <laughs> right. Um, There are a couple of ways to look at this and when you're talking about once, the way that we can measure that is using a preference test, essentially where we provide an animal multiple options and then we say you choose. And so that tells us what animals want. And then we can use something like a motivation test to measure how intensely animals want it. So how hard they're willing to work for that resource. And 
This is a tricky thing to measure, especially in dairy cattle who are about to give birth for a couple of reasons. One is that it only happens about once a year. Dairy cows, you know, don't give, they gestate for a long time. And so it becomes difficult for us to measure that compared to laying hens where we can look at it every day. Um, and the other reason is due to physiological changes. Um, Maria Rohrbang from Aarhus tried to look at how heavy of a gait cows are willing to push and she found out not very heavy. Um, and probably because that's due to changes in physiology and you know how a cow's body is preparing to give birth. Um, but I think one other way that we can look at it is through what I would call um, frustration or locomotory behavior. And what this is, is it's the theory of behavioral needs where an animal will perform a behavior until the need is satisfied. So if a cow is looking for a calving environment that is be determined to be suitable or desirable, like having a blind or something else that a cows want that we don't really know about, they will walk or perform exploratory behavior until they find that location. Um, and so I think that there are ways that we can get around looking at how much a cow wants it. But then if we think about positive welfare as well, you know, giving an animal the opportunity to perform a desirable behavior, even if the motivation isn't necessarily that strong, still has the opportunity to improve welfare, positive welfare, which I think is something that we're starting to think about more and more instead of simply reducing suffering. Yeah, and I'll add that for one of the biggest downsides to preference tests, as you probably know in your world, Phil, is that um, if you're giving them something that is not good for them, let's say if you give cows access to a bunch of concentrate, they're going to eat it all and get um, acidosis. So that's bad yeah. for them. But in the case of what Kate's done, it, there's, as far as we can tell, no downside to it. Um, except when you do have, like in the case of some of the other studies where We've seen some competition over hides. Uh, that might be the only downside. If you don't, if you don't give enough, they might fight over them. But to me, that also tells you if they're willing to fight over something. That also it adds more to what Kate has already said: is that they they're willing to fight for something. That means it's important to them. And if it's important to them, then and we can give it to them, then we should give it to them. Yeah, I think it's perfect what you said, and I think associating like um, I, I think that's. I don't, I don't know, but it seems like, you know, we, we have a lot of understanding on the biology of the cow and everything else. But then when it comes like to this paper, this information, it, for me, at least seems like the behavior we understand very well, but the markers associated in the physiology that corresponds to the cows being good or bad, that's the things that we are still kind of, you know, is BHP really a matrix for cows being good or bad? Is haptoglobin really the thing that we should be looking at or vaginal discharge or something. So I don't know, sometimes it feels like we are just going in circles, but uh, hopefully we are moving forward with the circle, right? Uh, but, uh, but, but I agree, if the want becomes with some differences or some indications, then that could be something uh, that could just explain if that's really a need or, or something that we should improve. Uh, and surprising enough, you know, the changes, if we think about that, maybe we're doing farms on pen design or other things, you think that we, based on this, right? Like that we would have studied years and years ago, the blinds and everything else would say, guys, we need to have a blind. And, you know, one week, two weeks after calving, they need to relax. That's not what we are doing, right? So, Hopefully now there is, I think, I don't know why you think it changed that this now it's being more accepted. Is it the, the stats or the analysis is more accepted now or people were just hammering hard, hard, they never gave up. And now it's not, I'm not going to say accepted, but it's, it seems to be more out there now that we can all talk about it, right? Katie, I'll take this oh. one. Yeah, well, I was going to say it's interesting because since I started presenting my data on cows hiding, um, I didn't think that was going to be the most interesting paper of my thesis. And yet it's what's made me known. That's what I'm known for is cows is hiding. Right? 
You're known yeah. by <laughs> And especially f- with dairy producers. And I found that like they, they really like the intuitive stuff and they know this stuff and they see it. And then when I tell them, here's the, here's the science behind it, then that's when they like a light bulb goes off and they realize, well, it makes sense. I mean, that especially dairy producers that have really good cow sense, they already know this stuff or have a sense of it, but having the science to back it is, um, I, I found it really fascinating as I talk to producers, at least in the scientific community, I think in general, you know, animal behavior and animal welfare is a very growing field and it's not quite as developed as nutrition and these other fields, which is interesting because if you look at other uh, species like humans, I mean, it's, it did take a while for us to also look at the psychology of health and the impact of stress on disease and all that kind of stuff. It took us a while um, to get there and to recognize that it's not all pseudoscience and what we do is actually real science and has a, a big contribution. But unfortunately, I still think there's a lot of people that are, uh, are, are still ingrained in the older philosophy that if you can feed the cow a right, the correct diet and keep her in whatever environment you want, she's going to do fine over transition. And I think we're starting to show that that's just not the case. There's a much bigger picture that we have to consider here. Yeah, and I think that's even in the, you know, the Discover Conference on the transition cows that we had a few months ago. And then there was something like said, hey, we need to go back to the to the cowman, you know, the cowman is disappearing. You know, that person that has that intuitive nature, and maybe they are doing things there that we don't even understand, and that's what makes a difference for a cow, maybe, to be successful or not during the transition period. So, what, what are those things? And and I think we, in all areas of research, maybe we get that. I remember Stephen LeBlanc. I'm going to pick on him again that he was comparing this uh, automated system saying, hey, cows, uh, you should be bred now. And then they go there and breed the cow and see the success if she gets pregnant or not. And they were collecting blood samples to see the whole hormones and see if that was the right moment. And for some reason, the farmer would not breed a cow and he would not explain why, but he was, I don't know, 80 or 90% correct. That cow was not supposed to be bred. But he, he never went back and say, okay, tell me the reason why you're not doing this to this cow. And of course, you do that with hundreds of cows. And then you may come up with this thing that, I don't know if her ear, her tail, whatever, there's something there. But I think like we don't even sometimes have the tool to understand that, right? Or at least we don't see a clear path to the paper, right? That's kind of some products we are searching. Then when we see this your paper, then you say, oh, now there is a venue from the question to the paper. Now, probably you stimulate more people to do the same thing because they already see the clear path, right? Uh, so I, I think that's uh, that's very positive and comes back to this other uh, things that this cowman or this person that understands the blind or whatever, and they are doing their farm, that we can capture that. So. Do you have a list of all these things that you want to explore in the future? Like now it's a blind, but farmers probably they tell you lots of stories. Like, hey, if <laughs> I do this, a wonder happens. If I do that, you should never do this to a cow or something. Oh, yeah. Do you have a list of things that you want to explore? <laughs> you know, it's it's the notebook that you keep on your desk where you jot down all of your study ideas. <laughs> Not on your desk, on your bed, because <laughs> during the night you may have an idea in your <laughs> do you have that Katie or oh for sure yeah and it's certainly the more I, I read about also the social science and that's also a growing field but there's quite a bit of literature growing now that the more you get producers in on some on research before you ask the question before you even develop the question you get them involved at early stages uh, the the more at the end of the day, the stuff that we actually do, the more likely it is to be accepted on farm as well, because it's something that has come from, uh, you know, partly not just our ivory tower scientists making things up based on what we think is important for dairy farmers, but dairy farmers being involved from the very beginning. So I think there should and hopefully will be more of that 
in the future. So do you want me to go through my list or no. just tell you that I have one? <laughs> But you I could give you one can. example. What is in that list? Tell me. Uh, so the next study we're going to do on this topic is um, actually to focus on the calf, because what we found in a different study that just got published in animals um, on with New Zealand cows and something that Margit Bach Jensen found in, at Aarhus University is that sometimes the cow won't hide but immediately after the calf is born, if there's a hiding space, the calf will find it and will hide. And the cow will then stand and protect the calf in that hiding space. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna do a study where we uh, give calves a hiding space instead of the cow to see it. And you know, if you think about why cows hide, um, it comes down to the protection of their offspring. So do we need to necessarily give the cow a place to hide or can we give, or should we give them both a place to hide? Um, and so for this, we're going to keep cows and calves together for the first week of life and then uh, see how long the calf stays hidden if we give them a hide in nature. Just having Kate and I are writing a, a little <laughs> proceedings on this, so it's fresh in my mind. Yeah. But in nature, calves will hide for the first few days of life. They won't come and be introduced to the herd until they're almost a week old. And that's mm -hmm. certainly not something we do. It's very different, drastically different than what we do in a dairy farm. Um, but can we also kind of use this idea of natural behavior from the calves perspective? So we'll see. I don't know the answer to that question yet. Cool. So you could do a blind with a little gate. They just open the blind, put the calf there, all figure out. They hide <laughs> the calf and they have the blind. <laughs> just kidding. So this paper you said from animals is out there already? Yep, it just came out. Either that or it's just in press, but I okay. think it's, I think it's out there. Yeah, it's uh, Gosha Zobel is the, the lead author on that one. It'll be out by the time this is uh, on YouTube, for sure. Okay. It's out. I was just reading it okay. earlier today, actually. <laughs> yeah, so what we found there is the cows didn't hide, but the calves did. 80, I think it was 80% of the calves where the cows didn't hide, the calves moved in. She's got this nice little graphic that shows the calves moving after they were born. And some of them within 20 minutes, they stood up and immediately found a place to hide. Kind of neat. Wow. So they probably have the instinct. It makes sense that a newborn baby calf might have the instinct to be in a, a warm, dark place. That does not mean that we should in necessarily individually house them in a warm, dark place without any other calves or cows around. I think in this study, we're looking at keeping, having some cow co calf contact which is what would happen in nature. So adapting that to a commercial setting is something that we'll think about after we see kind of what we find here. Hmm. That's, that's very interesting. The, so now related to this paper here with the blind, you've mentioned that you have some other things coming up, right? Uh, do you wanna talk a little bit about it or no? Yeah, I don't have all of the the results freshly in my mind, but I can think of the big ones. Yeah. Um, and so we have two papers coming out that looked at the calving behavior 24 hours before calving. Um, so those are under review right now. And so we found a couple of really interesting things. Um, one was that cows started to use the blind in the hours leading up to calving and then had a preference for using the blind to, get, to give birth. So even though it is a really simple one-sided structure in the pen um, and not one of the more, I would say fully enclosed structures that we've seen in some of the other studies, cows will still use it if it's provided. Um, and then the other thing that I found was really interesting from one of those papers coming out is that we looked at the um, inter-cow distance. So we wanted to see how far cows were from the other animals in the pen. Because one of the things that we see in nature is that cows seek isolation in the form of distance to their herd as they approach calving. And so we found that in our high and low stocking density pens, cows began to get further away from other cows in the pen as they approach calving, but it was really obvious in the low stocking density pens. So where they had double the amount of space, they fully utilized all of the space that they had and sort of tried to get as far away from the other animals in their pen as possible. So, so how did you, sorry, how did you measure the distance? 
Yep. I would have loved to use a automated sort of technology to measure the distance. But what I did was created, um, it was sort of an overlay that I put over my computer screen and then mm -hmm. divided the pen into grids, um, equal sized grids. And so we could say that this is where the cow who was about to have the grid that she was in, and then where all of the other cows in the pen, the grids that they were in. So I used instantaneous scan sampling to count the cow who was giving birth and all the other cows in the pen at different times before calving. And then say that, you know, the cow who's about to give birth is X number of grids away than the other cows in the pen. And so even using that crude measure, we saw that there was a difference in inter-cow distance. That's cool. That's pretty smart. Yeah. Yeah. So what it tells us is that, um, Cows who are housed indoors that we maybe haven't selected mothering for mothering ability still have that drive to perform calving behaviors that we would see in more natural settings. There's two more things that I'll add only because I was just looking through the revisions. <laughs> and so it is fresh in my mind, but I think that kind of round out the story. So I'll add those. And one is that Kate found that um, she looked at the length of labor starting from uh, when the cow started having abdominal contractions, which we consider one of the landmarks of the second stage of labor, kind of the expulsive stage. It's usually about an hour in cows. And she found that it was uh, the shortest in cows that had a blind and more space and the longest in, in the other treatment. So not sure against whether there that's relevant. We didn't, we weren't able to use dystocia as an outcome, but that could be the next step. Mm -hmm. But at least we know it might link to the haptoglobin step. I don't know. Um, but just the fact that they had, they had shorter labor might tell us that they might be having a more natural birth and they might be less inter, there might be less interference from other cows that might prolong labor. And then the other thing that really ties in with what Kate said earlier about um, potentially frustration, again, we don't know this for sure, is that she looked at how the cows explored or used their pin using that grid. She looked at how many times they crossed over grid lines in the hours leading up to calving. And we had predicted that in the, in the larger pins, they would have more locomotor behavior because they have more space. But we actually found that the most locomotor behavior we found was in the high stocking density pin without a blind. And so that might mean, and I, again, we have to speculate here, but it might mean those cows are showing some signs of frustration that they can't find a good space. They can't separate. They don't have a physical hide. So they just are wandering around the pen looking for a place to give birth. That's very interesting. And that's all- You got those results right, Kate, right? Yeah, you got them right. <laughs> okay, good. And that was one paper. Then you said you have another one. Those are kind of a mixture of the two. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> so they're it. submitted as um, companion papers. Oh, there was I too see. too much data for them to go into one. Okay. So they're yeah. going to come out probably at the same time? Is that yeah. how it works? As long as they get accepted. Yes. Oh, okay. Knock on wood. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, sounds good. Uh, so you guys were very generous with your time. You know, we talk here for more than an hour now. And uh, so I'm really thankful for both of you for um, chatting with me and explaining me uh, all, all that goes on in this paper. Uh, I find it fascinating. And I think is, you know, maybe what's more fascinating is what's to come ahead, right? That it's, it's still a lot of things to, to come. And, uh, but is there anything that I didn't ask you guys that I should have asked? I don't think so. I think we pretty much covered it, Katie. If anyone is looking to hire an amazing assistant <laughs> professor, <laughs> Dr. Kate Kurtzinger will be looking for jobs soon. And for some crazy reason, she's decided to stay in academia. So that's true. I think every department should have somebody <laughs> because uh, in that field, because like you said, I think it enriches so much the discussion yep. for. Mm -hmm. experimental design you know not even on the cow side but even starting to think about and uh, I can see a lot of trials coming up even as a you know you have one trial going on and you can have maybe some other things that can explain a little bit more the behavior fairly easy so uh, yeah I wish there was a 
was a thing, but I think it's getting better. Okay. So that's where you think you're going to head, Kate, more into the academia or no? Yeah, I am on the market and actively looking. So I, you know, I'm at Guelph, which I'm loving right now working with veal calves. It's a, it's a totally new um, field for me, but so interesting. I hate to say that I actually never thought about calves before I started this job, but now I think about them quite a bit. Um, so yes, I am hoping to get um, an assistant professorship somewhere. That's, that's the goal. They're few and far between, but yeah, that's, cool. that's what I'm hoping for, to do more of these studies and figure out what it is that we need to give our cows. Yeah, it seems like you have the knowledge is now just wait for that window to open, right? Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. Thank you very much, guys. Awesome. Great talking to you. Yeah, thanks, Phil. Mm -hmm.